So welcome to our second session uh, with Hani. We had uh, the previous session was kind of the introduction. We discussed several topics that were interconnected, but it was not quite clear yet how they are connected. In my memory, in my understanding, um, you started with uh, basically describing that you feel isolated, you often feel alone, uh, that there is um, a lack of sense of purpose, um, and instead rather a sense of floating. Uh, so that seems to be connected with not having the support system that you're longing for. And then we, when we explored further, there was there emerged kind of a, a biographical theme out of that when you mentioned that um, probably one of the sources of that is uh, that you lacked a support system from the times when you were young, even, mm -hmm. and that your parents couldn't give you the support system that a child needed. And that from the time on, or at that time, you started to uh, to self-control, to self-control in order to have something to control in contrast to the parental system that was um, uh, insecure and unstable mm -hmm. and you didn't know uh, exactly when there was a time to be concerned and afraid of and when it was safe. So you described that uh, as a re response to that high uncertainty uh, in the parental system that you started to control yourself and one way of controlling yourself seems to have been um, a certain kind of sadness and yeah a kind of gravitating towards that i'm not sure maybe as a response to insecure surroundings again now we leave the parental system and go into mm -hmm. teenage and, and older years um and then as a kind of as um as an attempt to maybe bring about a small change or more understanding to the system i suggested a twofold uh exercises uh one to consciously let go of uh the self-control in experimental time frame so in times when you practice meditation or breathing or journaling to practice as far as possible of course uh a conscious letting go of the self-control and the second one, because I had kind of an intuition that there is a lack of love in the system and mostly self-love, um, mm -hmm. to see and what comes around when you practice the intent, a very specific intent of self-care and self-love. Um, and to plant that as a seed, this intent, and to see how your system reacts to that. Now, I know when I give such um, suggestions or assignments, I don't expect people to fully you know, comply with that. I'm just interested in what, you know, what came about. Uh, if, if it turned to something else, if you had other insights, uh, if you could maybe still practice uh, some of those things. So this is where I would like to start with those exercises and, and see uh, if there was any difference there or any insight uh, and then I would like to expand kind of on the understanding of how those different topics uh, of sadness loneliness and self-control how they connect mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah it was a bit hard um, for me with the I guess the exercises mm -hmm. um, I actually realized as you were speaking that I, I haven't been journaling <laughs> so mm -hmm. as much as I was doing so before. So that obviously um, mm, if I'm not journaling, then it's hard to kind of do the exercise in itself. <laughs> but I think it's also because in the, la the last time we spoke, um, I've 
I am now I'm in the process of finding a new place, not because I, I decided, but I was so I think it's been a lot of more stress on my plate. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've been focusing on that and trying to just remain calm in the in this kind of mm, in this moment of kind of instability because I still have no idea where I'm gonna live in two weeks. So it's kind of like yeah. Um, I think I've been trying to um, keep going in the self of being proactive in all of the things that I have to do in my life right now and it's been a bit hard to focus on the meditating and the journaling I think it's just like I'm but in saying all that I did come to other I've been, th I think I've been, I was thinking about um, um, how I am comfortable in a place where I don't really want to be. And I, I was starting to realize that, that I don't necessarily, because um, I think we spoke last time about the fact that it doesn't like these um, that it's not like constant things that I'm saying to myself that keeps yeah. me in a place of um, kind of unhappiness but I started noticing more and more that it's in I'll replay situations or scenarios that have happened even maybe years ago or could have happened last week that some somewhere I was uncomfortable or there was some kind of conflict or something that made me feel bad and I'll just replay the situation in my head and, and I won't even realize I'm doing it like I have to kind of wake up out of it and then it obviously evokes these emotions in me that I know uh, that I don't want to be in but it's like this constant replay of like not happy moments and it could even possibly be things that haven't even happened that I'm like that I was like, had, I was mm, like situation where maybe I could have answered it in a different way because I maybe didn't stand up for myself or no. I wasn't clear on like, on how I was, um, I don't know what my view or thoughts were. And then I will like have these conversations that also haven't happened. <laughs> where I like really stand up for myself and I, and I have confrontation with the person, but then I realize that I'm just getting upset and then mm. I'm just getting, you know, and it's not like a place for me to be in, but it's like, I feel like I'm in these constant loops of these like situations in my head where mm. it ke obviously keeps me in a place where I'm never going to get out of it. I'm not going to ever feel happiness if I'm in, the, in having these constant situations which aren't having or ha aren't happening or have happened you know like years and years ago but yeah. I'm still replaying them somewhat yes. in my mind yes so this is mm -hmm. quite characteristic and it's good that you mm -hmm. kind of became aware of this trance that you're in right so those yeah. past events um they they uh have they have put you in a place of a st stasis in the sense that it doesn't matter almost how much time has passed, the moments occur or those memories occur as, uh, fresh and they create the feelings that apparently they have created back then, be it upsetness with the situation or with yourself or replaying mm -hmm. as we, we often do, right? We often kind of replay situations and to think, oh, I should have said that, I could have said that. But mm -hmm. usually it goes away after it wears off, right? So what seems unusual in your case is that the mind is still obsessing uh, with the pain that occurred in the situations and try to fix the situation on a fantasy level. I, I, I could have said that, I should have said that as, if that, that, as if that would change something, but in fact, it doesn't, right? It still repeats itself. No. I mean, I, and sometimes it's not even that I get to that point of having that conversation where like, for example, I'm standing up for myself. It could just be, I'm replaying that situation where I was uncomfortable or, yeah. you know, it wasn't something happened where 
it just uh, and it will loop for days and sometimes I'm realizing that these the situation happened months ago and it's still like constantly in my and it makes me feel awful like it makes yes. me have anxiety it makes me get upset and I'm just like and I'm I think obviously it's very hard to like feel anything else if you're constantly in this like state of always having being in these stories that all the narratives are all, all mm -hmm. like they're they're not positive feelings so it's so it's like well yeah I'm not gonna feel better I'm not gonna move forward if this is con a continuous like habit I mean it's a habit like what, yes. <laughs> what yes. else can I call it yes. The, so in some sense I, sorry yeah mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. sense i was gonna say that uh, maybe it's even like a, an addiction like <laughs> that something you don't want but you continuously just keep going towards it's like yes. what i don't understand but uh, exactly yeah. so when we look at it from the perspective of our conscious being it doesn't make much sense right mm -hmm. even more so because there seems to be a strong imbalance it's not that yeah. kind of positive events pop up in our head as kind of automatically and then we just indulge in them and enjoy ourselves and so on. It seems to be, of course, positive events also come up, but uh, there seems to be a favor of the system to remind us of difficult uh, experiences yeah. and to replace those, to replay those. And that seem, doesn't seem to make much sense on a conscious level, because as you say, it just makes us suffer just makes us uncomfortable yeah. and, bad and so on so let's try to re kind of to understand it more from mm -hmm. an unconscious level put yourself in the position of that voice that comes up again and again right and there are patterns because it's not just one situation there are several situations and they seem to be similar in the sense that they make you feel in a similar way they take energy away they upset you they make you sad and so, yeah. on. so put yourself in the position from where this is coming from and voice what is the intent of that what does it want this voice it wants something from you it there is an expectation there right because this is how you respond you try to act on it in a certain way what does it want it doesn't want you to be happy it wants something else what else does it want? <laughs> yeah it does not want me to be happy that's for sure um <laughs> uh, i don't it's can you bring up a certain memory like that you know this uh, thing that comes up again, and again yeah i mean the thing that i can i i think that for me i can relate it to being a child and being around a parent that was very negative and constantly saying negative things and criticizing me mm. and and i don't i don't know if it was that i've just learned that pattern and and instead of having somebody else on the outside say that to you it's kind of now like now i've just taken it on and now i say it to myself in the but in the sense of situations not actually saying like oh you're this or you're that or you don't do this right or but it's I mean I don't know it's just it's very like it's, it's I think it's just hard for me to connect to happy feelings it's and but before we come to the happy feelings can you describe more yeah. what is actually happening in your mind so you say yes it's not phrases so last time you mentioned it's more like a feeling it's more like a way a weight that is on mm. your mind can you describe more how it manifests usually and in contrast to that how in the past week or so you saw that there is actually story sometimes behind that behind yeah it seemed to be a vague feeling i think it's that i think it's that i am in the in this constant loop of just like bad scenarios that sometimes i don't even realize that i'm telling oh, I'm in it my brain is in a story because mm -hmm. I'm just feeling the emotion until it's like really replaying vividly because I've noticed that when I wake up I wake up I'm already feeling very nervous and anxious even though I may not have had any bad dreams but I'm already I, I open my eyes and that I'm already in this story yes yes so it's it's 
Uh, give me an example of that story. What could that be? What kind of situation is that? Oh, gosh. Um, Mm. Oh, I'm trying to think of what, yeah. what has been going on in my mind. Um, I don't know. I, my brain just like going like a thousand, like it's just like going so quick. Like I can't even yes. think of one, <laughs> one solid thing. That's okay. That's okay. Ugh. So because this is also relevant, right? We already see that there are different dynamics at place. So the, on the one hand, we have um, the memory loops of specific situations that are there. And then mm -hmm. there seems to be a censorship that, uh, it is kind of a protective mechanism that says, I don't want to get into it. I don't want to experience this again and again. I want to black it out. Now, of mm. course, it's not fully effective because it leaves you with a feeling, but at least right. it doesn't make you to re-experience this painful moment again and again. So these are two mm. forces and you experience both of them. Unless you take your conscious efforts and you know, as you did in the past week or weeks, uh, you kind of wake up from these trances and uh, realize which kind of specific memory loop it was. But even now in this situation, uh, the censorship works well and doesn't allow you just a conscious uh, access to these mm -hmm. kind of memories. Now, okay, it's, you know, I asked for a specific situation because it's, it's kind of can be helpful to work with uh, yeah, yeah. memories and to evoke the feelings, but uh, we can still kind of figure out part of these. If we take away the censorship part, which uh, I just assume, you know, is a self-protective mechanism. And so we again see that specific memories come up of painful events in your past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What could be the purpose of that? Why would the system bother you with that? To be honest, I'm, I, I don't, I can't come up with like a clear answer to that because mm -hmm. it's like, I'm trying, I've been trying to, um, kind of move away from that in the sense that I want to feel differently. Yes. And I just can't seem to. I don't know what the purpose of that is besides like being in a state that I've always known and and maybe finding like we spoke about that I that I somehow find some comfort in it even though it's just not what I want and I'm like trying to think about it in a like protective sense like I'm trying to protect myself, but exactly what from I don't, I don't know because it's. Hmm. I. <sighs> yes, and both of these aspects can be there. So what you said before, it's a kind of uh, it's a sense of uh, comfort that I get because I got mm -hmm. used to it. This speaks for the part of us that wants to identify. We are as beings, we are attaching all the time. Mm -hmm. Right, we attach to people. We attach to objects our favorite you know whatever souvenir our favorite pillow uh, this and that the favorite situations the restaurant i like to go uh the friends that i like family members that i love and so on so the attachment is there and we can just as well uh, attach to inner states so if i without really consciously kind of wanting it but uh getting part of my self-identity from certain feelings i can get attached to these feelings 
even sadness, even discomfort, uh, mm -hmm. even pain, which then is an encouragement for the system to, to bring up uh, again and again the same feelings because of the identification with them. So I am a loner. I am a sad person. I am this and that, right? And then I get attached to these. I want to see myself in this way because it's better to see myself in this way than not to have any self-image at all. So I grasp and hold on to that. So this is one part, the attachment part. And the self-protection part, let's put it this way. You, you said in different contexts already, I want to feel differently. I want to mm -hmm. know what I want to do with my life. I want to be able to uh, connect to people in a different way. And when you express that, you emphasize the role that we as conscious beings have as being the captains, the navigators of our system. Mm -hmm. In a way, we have the unique position with our conscious mind to decide and to take actions uh, of how to change our lives. And here, I think, when we experience pain, that basically our, uh, our system responds to that in pointing out the failure in good navigation, in good captainship, and say, look, you failed in this situation. You, your job is to protect, to protect us from pain, and you didn't solve that. Because what happened might just as well happen again. Mm -hmm. You are responsible for protecting us, us meaning kind of your, your conscious being, but also the whole organism. And in that sense, and I wonder uh, how you think and feel about that, it would make sense to me that the loop is going on. If mm -hmm. the unconscious thinks she still hasn't taken care of this, we still don't feel safe that when a similar situation occurs, she would know what to do. Mm -hmm. How does does it make any sense to you? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. But I think it's a bit hard for me to understand why I would continuously Mm. I don't know because I feel like there's two sides in me like I, I feel like well obviously as people we always have different sides but it, I feel like I'm also always constantly trying to improve and change and and be proactive and then it's like and then I don't it's like, I think it's unclear to me how these two things fit when I'm mm -hmm. trying so hard to, I don't know. So it's, it's very, it's a bit confusing to me in a sense. Like, yes. I feel like there's like an inner conflict of these things because I also like when you were saying, oh, like for example, oh, I, I'm a sad person or I'm alone or this. And it's like, it's trying to think, do I think about like myself in that way? And I would not, I would not describe ever like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't describe myself that way. I would say, oh, I'm a positive person, very happy. Like, I think what people see here is quite different about, about than how I feel. But then there's also this other, the, the inner feelings of like, yeah. of that are so quite contrasted to how I would describe myself. So yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's a bit confusing. All. Um, yeah. um, that's... Uh, let's see if it goes anywhere right and um mm -hmm. i remember a story uh of you know one of those uh, spiritual stories um but maybe it makes sense here there is um there is kind of um, the, the teacher slash fool uh kind of figure and um he's uh at night and um, there is the lantern and underneath the lantern he's looking for something Disciple comes along and asks the teacher, teacher, can I help you? Are you looking for something? The teacher says, yes, I'm looking for the key for the house. So he starts, the disciple helps along with uh, searching. And so on. eventually there is nothing to find. I ask him, are you sure you lost the key here? And the teacher says, no, I didn't lose the key here. 
but here there is light. Mm. Um, and what I try to highlight with that is when we attempt to improve our lives, when we try to uh, get better in certain fields, be it in relationships or just with ourselves, it might be that sometimes we go to the areas that at least we know how to operate, how to do these improvements, but it not, might not be where the discomfort is actually coming from or not exactly where it's coming from. Mm. Right? So mm -hmm. often enough, you know, in therapy, I, I also recommend to people when they're in stress and uh, depressed or anxious and so on to do sports, right? Because sport exhausting oneself physically has similar effect as, effect as sauna or massage. It brings kind of the muscle tone down and helps us to get a little bit of relief. But this is not where yeah. the issue is from. It's kind of a crutch yeah. to help us along. Now, you mm -hmm. do more uh, fundamental things in your self-development. But my question is, is it possible that through accessing those uh, loop memories, you might discover what where kind of fundamentally the key was lost, so to speak, and mm -hmm. to have a precise understanding of what could be necessary to be done. Uh, and that would take away the pressure. Um, and sometimes it doesn't need to be much different. So it could be that you already understood a lot and kind of worked on that. But the, but the sense of um, insecurity and the unconscious sense that you're not steering the ship well might come from the residue that has not yet been realized and that there's still this sense of danger that a similar situation might occur. So this is just a suggestion for me, uh, and I'm interested mm -hmm. to just reflect on that. I'm not saying that this is how it is, but um, just taking into account that the censorship is working so well, kind of my instinct would say that there are yet unrealized aspects that are still frightening, that are still threatening, in those memories and that this kind of the sensor part of your mind decides that it's too uncomfortable to realize it yet. Yeah. I mean, that would make sense because there are definitely, and I mean, may, this is just what I'm was coming to mind right now with what mm -hmm. you're saying, but there's definitely certain situations or, <clears throat> or sounds I hear or, um, mm, that will mm, that will just put me in a state of so uncomfortable and anxiety and panic mm. and I don't know from where it comes from like I don't um and I keep and I and I have thought about it that maybe there is something that I'm still it's not obviously clear to me what it is but there is some my body is somewhat reacting and protecting me but i don't know exactly mm -hmm. from where it from stems what? from mm -hmm. yes yeah yes so for that obviously it would be interesting to continue what you already started as a practice basically to become aware of to to take the um the vague feeling mm -hmm. uh, of discomfort, sadness, whatever it is, and to use that as the thread to um, reconnect with the situation that is on loop, right? And to, in this case, really to document those situations so that they don't slip away again. So to do this again and again, what you did already, what you started doing, and to remember as many as possible, not to remember, but to retrieve the situations that are behind those feelings that create those more vague feelings and to have a kind of a basic set of situations that then you could go into and you know can replay them more consciously to connect with how you felt back then and where the sense of danger came from from which aspect of this memory was it someone that was threatening me, you know, emotionally or physically, for example? Was it more a state of insecurity, a state of not knowing 
who I am and what I want to do in this situation, which made me freeze, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of a classic trauma response, the freezing and the dissociating. So, and that this freezing was experienced as kind of super painful and difficult to take because I was helpless. I didn't see any alternative. I, I, I didn't know what to do. Uh, so to kind of disentangle these and to use those replays to get a clearer sense of what the imminent danger was or the pain in that situation. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could, um, you could do this, you know, and just to add on what you did already to write them down, those situations, so that you can just easily access them. So it would be just to clarify what you're saying to when I'm having these like loops or stories in my mind to write them down and then try to kind of see the correlating, um, I guess, theme throughout them. Is that what you mean? There might be, this might be a second thing. So first of all, within okay. one memory, one memory loop yeah. to put myself in the position of, okay, what did I actually feel back then? What is the uncomfortable thing there? Uh, and it might be that, you know, a certain sound or a certain situation, but behind that there is an, a scene, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just, I don't know, the popping of a balloon, but the popping of a balloon was, was at a birthday party where something really uncomfortable happened, like none, none of my friends showed up, you know, or something like that, so that it would reveal a kind of bigger part of the story. And then if there is a trend, if there is a pattern across several of those memories, then it would emerge by itself then mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to actively search for the pattern it will show itself if it's again and again a very similar thing yeah, and you, you, yeah. I mean, writing it down is a possibility of course you know drawing a situation is very evocative and helpful or uh, you can just you know if if you're in a hurry or something and you don't have the time to write an elaborate situation you just voice record it on your phone but just to have it somewhere so that you can easily access it when you need to when you have more time mm -hmm. okay does yeah. it make sense to you that that might be worthwhile yeah 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 i mean i definitely i mean i think it would provide more clarity as to <laughs> what what it what the underlying I guess hmm. situation is is there how do you feel about attempting this No, I think it, I think it's like, um, I think there's something that's manageable because I think I know kind of where my limit is mm -hmm. the sense of like, okay, I need to, I can't continue. Um, or um, I'm, I'm, my brain is sorry, is like going on again, like <laughs> there's so much yeah. that I'm like <laughs> having a bit of trouble, like really pinpointing what I'm trying to say, but mm, I think it's like what I'm thinking right now is that I, I think a lot of um, a lot of these um, themes or situations or stories I've obviously been that have happened when as an adult have been in somewhat a feeling of situations that I was in as a child, mm -hmm. but it's very much different in the sense that now I'm an adult. So 
I'm able to respond or act in a different way than I was as a child. Yes. But in some sense, I'm still going back to that feeling. And I don't know, I, I'm just like, um, uh, I don't know, just, but it's just, uh, um, I think I'm just, I understand that it's two different things in some sense. Like I understand being a child and not being in some sense able to take care of the situation because as a child it is very different, obviously as an adult, mm -hmm. but it's just, I, it's just very, I guess, frustrating in some sense that it's like, I'm still living in that. Yes. In those moments in some sense. Yes. So if I may, to try to describe a couple of phenomena that, that sure. I know is mm. so, for example, we talk about loop situations like these, right? Yeah. So often enough, uh, something is on loop that is not from my early childhood, that is, you know, like you already hinted at a month ago mm -hmm. or three months ago, and this might up, mm -hmm. come up again and again, as if that was a huge event, right? as we are organized unconsciously it doesn't have to it might contain a similar theme as something that happened again and again in the past but it just resurfaces as a loop of a situation that occurred previously long not long time ago so what we are trying to access is a certain theme of helplessness or aggression or pain or whatever these those typical situations that create those loop memories so we try to create a, an, a, an access to this theme knowing that probably it stands for many things that happened before and probably for kind of constellations and situations that happened when i was a, a young child teenager teenager but we don't have to necessarily access those super early memories these are difficult to retrieve, but we can assume that the theme resurfaces in this thing that is the actual loop, which happened only a month ago, two, three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a valid kind of working hypothesis. I can work on these themes, of insufficiency, of, you know, self-criticism, all of these things. Uh, on a recent event, knowing that it's probably connected in more deeper tissues with a chain of events that you know stands for the similar theme so i don't know if i picked up correctly what you tried to say but i would not be discouraged by kind of the the seemingly strong work that is necessary for that we take it one bit at a time we take the recent memory okay. that is on loop thinking that it probably will kind of solve other issues as well once we worked through them or it might bring up other memories that stand behind that but i would not be discouraged by you know the vastness the potential vastness of it ideally the theme is contained in this recent memory and by resolving that it would resolve also those chains of um, of of memories of pains that stand behind that and then it's like a domino you know kind of I, I make one stone topple and then that leads to the toppling of the other stones as well without me actively mm -hmm. doing something necessarily about it mm -hmm. yeah so it's really just getting hold of two three situations loops like these in my memory putting myself in that situation again evoking the feeling asking myself what is my feeling the response to to what exactly what exactly produces this uh, difficult feeling whatever it is right the sadness the pain and so on and then with uh, some work i'm getting there and also in conversations um, that we have so hopefully in the next conversation uh, we could go through a situation like this and um, discuss either what you have found by yourself or in our conversation you could go deeper and uh, describe more 
Okay. I have another um, question about a topic, mm -hmm. and I'm curious of uh, if that is of importance to you. Is there a kind of sense to be, are you afraid of being dependent on someone? How would you describe that? <laughs> I just, I don't think that, I don't think I know how to be. I think that's kind mm. of been also um, <clears throat> a theme that, um, that's you know like I've encountered throughout my life and and it's like um it was um really like ingrained in me from a young age to always mm, always depend on yourself mm -hmm. that mm, that there is the only real thing that you can trust is yourself. So just depend on you. Mm -hmm. And I think this has been something that is like constantly, constantly been, um, I mean, it's very hard for me to ask for help. And I feel more comfortable in doing things and taking thing, care of things on my own and I think I'm just, and I just, I just feel more comfortable just relying on myself mm -hmm. and just because I've always done things like this. And I mean, I was an only child for a very long time until I was 10 and it was like, and I was also, of course, as I said, always ingrained, I had this ingrained of just like this independence, like you just be, just, just rely on yourself. And, and then, you know, seeing my, my mother as like a, a single mother and just like having to figure everything out practically on her, on her own. And mm. it's just been like, and I mean, and then also throughout the years, like, have been trying to be more open in the sense that it's okay to rely on people and get help from people and mm -hmm. um and then in some sense some sometimes being disappointed you know that yeah so uh, yeah so many I things mean, that you describe they mm -hmm. are normal it's good to be independent it's good to yeah. have the sense of self-efficacy of mm. course uh, luckily we have now a generation where women are more independent yeah um, than the past so i'm certainly not advocating you know to go back to a state of kind of being dependent on other people mm -hmm. uh, my question is kind of, it goes in the direction mm. of how do i what is the quality of the theme for you because on the one hand i can be positive i can have a positive quality of independence Right, which allows for some flexibility, realizing where my limitations are, and then when necessary, setting up the conditions for asking people for help. Of course, the mm -hmm. right people, of course, people mm -hmm. that are kind of trustworthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would be a positive spin on the theme of independence and um, avoiding situations where I overly depend on other people. On the other hand, I can dread dependence because dependence in the past created horrible situations for me maybe not yeah. objectively but it felt i was very vulnerable and this vulnerability was then met with rejection or with disappointment and then out of that emerged you know a theme of i will never let that happen again i want to be independent i don't want some uh, whatever jerks people taking advantage of me or not responding with help when i need to and then it kind of leaves this positive quality, becomes more rigid and mm. with a certain kind of dread, which, for example, makes it difficult for me to open up at all to other people mm. because I don't want them to have access to a vulnerability that they could misuse or right. that the vulnerability that I would develop in such opening up 
would automatically make me gravitate emotionally to those people and wanting to connect and reaching out, deepening the friendship, and then to meet again and again with a rejection because I opened up and became vulnerable would feel so much more hurtful. So I could avoid that um, strongly uh, so that that doesn't happen. And then it becomes, like I said, unhealthy and too rigid and not representing uh, a fair estimate of the possibilities that are around me, not giving the people around me a real chance, but just blocking myself off of that. And then, of course, that does something with me. It makes me closed off. It makes me rigid. So what I guess I'm trying to understand is where on the spectrum are you? Do you sometimes fluctuate or is it a rigidity? No, I think that I, I do um, fluctuate. Um, But I do think that in, it, I, I don't see it as a positive thing to have to reach out to people or mm -hmm. ask for help or like even really open up to friends. It takes me like, a, it takes me a long time and it doesn't feel like a positive thing. It's kind of like, oh, I'm in such a shitty state that mm, I a need... <laughs> To kind of get support because I don't even know how to manage this on my own or mm -hmm. or that I need another opinion because I don't even like I, I don't know how to figure it out on my own so yeah. it's and and I think that and saying that I mean I'm just I think for me it's also been a hard thing because it's like if I couldn't really even be dependent on my own parents it's like I was already I already that was already something that was ingrained in me. It was like already had to be very self-sufficient, you know? Yeah. So it's just like, it's, it's just how I am, I guess, is because it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. But in the other sense, it's, I do want to connect to, with other people and I do want to be able to feel it's okay to be open and ask for help and, but it, it doesn't come like um it's not a positive feeling it's mm -hmm. when it needs to happen and yes yeah. and that is a missed opportunity i mean I, there are certainly mm -hmm. situations where it kind of it becomes really uncomfortable like for example just to ask people for money is super uncomfortable right yeah uh or in other you know major things um so there is a validity there but uh, what is a shame is that kind of reaching out to people is also a means to connect with them. To allow yeah. someone to help me and to be supportive is also a gift because exactly because I'm opening up and I'm kind of showing a more vulnerable side. And for someone on the other side who is longing for that, you know, a friend or potential friend or potential partner, who is looking for all these signs because they want to support you that would be a shame if the situation never comes up because there's an inner longing for connection and then on your side it would be kind of a rejection of that need of the other to to support you to reach out to you to look out for you and so on and here again yeah. the ideal is the mix it's not to be constantly you know yeah taking. of course Right. It's always, yeah. always the give and take that makes the magic in, in good relationships. Yeah, of course. Is, I guess you don't have big problems with that. That's just my assumption that you don't have a big problem with uh, supporting people if they ask you. No, for me, I think that's the other thing is that I'm like a very, very, in that sense, um, giving person that mm -hmm. if my friends need help or they need to talk or they need you know, anything that I'm able to help with, support with, like, I feel like that's, that's who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's not, it's not easy for me to, to be on the to ask for that. Side. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But that means that you know the joy of it as well. I mean, sometimes it's a burden, yes, but there's often enough in people who have practice with that and practice of giving mm. and supporting 
there is the quality of joy that comes with that. Joy maybe is the wrong word, but it's kind of it's satisfying to be able to give that. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I suggest is imagine that you're on the other side. You can give this joy to other people, this jo this satisfaction to other people around you as well, to the friends who deserve this trust and not to keep it from them of through an um, kind of misunderstood, exaggerated feeling of self-sufficiency. Keeping that, keeping them from experiencing the satisfaction of supporting you. Yeah. Right, the feeling that you know so well. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting for me because it might play into the situations that are in loop. Mm. Um, because usually there are a couple of aspects there that make me suspect that there is a possible connection. Usually when we are on loop, uh, kind of negative loops in our mind, we replay past situations and we replay past situations which put us into a childlike position mm. of inactivity or of helplessness. And this, especially as adults, makes us super uncomfortable. As children, we are constantly in this place as children. Yeah. But as adults, for example, by you know, a boss or by someone of authority to, to be put in a place yeah. where, no, you shut up, you cannot do anything right now. And to be in this helpless, helpless place, that is very, very uncomfortable, puts us into a childlike state. And the childlike state is characterized by complete dependence on the surrounding. Mm. And this is something that we often forget. Sometimes we think, oh, what a happy child, you know, when we see friends, children, and so on. If we forget that this is not only the quality of the child that is happy, but it reflects the safe dependence, basically, on its surrounding, that the parents are nour nourishing and supportive. Put the same child uh you know into a mall and it's lost this child becomes super insecure because the thing that stabilizes the child uh is gone and you know the worst examples is look at street children they look you know 30 years older than their age mm -hmm. because they experience so much hardship without the protection of benevolent uh supporters and parents and so on so there is Typically, there is a theme of dependence that um, is difficult. People in relationships struggle with this topic as well. Often, we try to find the balance of dependency, independency, being strong and supportive versus sometimes asking for help. And that's always a balance act. That's never easy to really mm -hmm. figure out with people. There is one aspect of this, of asking help, that I would like to uh, highlight and ask your kind of your connection to it. There is a skill aspect of that. For example, I I need help, but I dread the thought of asking my friend because I don't want them to feel overburdened or feel pushed into a situation that they are uncomfortable with. Right? This is often a fantasy that people have. Mm. The skill aspect is to call up the friend and to tell him, look. Um, there is kind of this topic, I need support, and then to let them know what the uh, limits of this is. So for example, do you have half an hour time to talk to me? It can mm -hmm. be now or it can be to tomorrow or the other, the day afterwards. But in I'm looking for a support in those two next days. Are you capable of doing this? Right? So I give them the possibility, I don't leave too much to their fantasy. The fantasy, for example, oh God, this might go on forever now. I don't have the time or capacity for that. I let them know it will take half an hour, an hour or whatever it is. So they can, they can say yes or no to that. I let them know what kind of topic it is. Mm -hmm. It's about my relationship, for example, so that they can say, look, I'm happy to help you. I don't think that I'm a good support in relationship mm. questions or to say sure a third thing that i can ask uh, or let them know is what i would hope to get from you is that you just listen or that you give me some advice from your experience mm. or 
that I kind of feel your take on this because I'm lacking an outside perspective. So it doesn't have to be real advice. I'm just interested in your thought about this. So again, I give them a limit, so to speak, of what my expectations are so that they don't have to go into the fantasies and think like, oh, what could I suggest to her? I don't know anything about this and so on. But if you say, I just want you to listen, they can say, well, I can do that. I'm not an expert, but listen, I can. Yeah. So there's this skill aspect of how to set up a situation where I'm asking for help. Uh, yeah. And what interests me is, are you good in that? Do you know how to do that? Or is that a factor that kind of inhibits your reaching out? Um, I think half of it, half of what you're saying in that skill I've used before, maybe not, maybe not in the, the timing that, oh, can I have, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe half an hour or maybe and also in the other sense that oh maybe I just need someone to listen to me I think that when I reach out to people it's usually like I'm really sorry to bother you <laughs> that's like mm -hmm. usually how I start things yeah. really sorry to bother you um but um I have a question or and or I need some advice would you be able to speak this evening about mm -hmm. blah 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 and um sometimes it's been you know I have some friends that will be like yeah, of course and then there's another friends that I think maybe I've left it too open where I mm. haven't received a response in like two or three weeks and then I'm like oh I forgot to respond to you and then because I've left it up whenever you have time <laughs> so it's like yeah. well <laughs> but then it's so maybe in a sense of providing maybe a time limit or uh, I don't know may, maybe also they were imagined that because it's such a big topic that we'd be talking all afternoon and I was looking for someone to really like be a therapist or I don't know for example I don't know what's yes. going on in there yes what what their experience has been because maybe I don't know everyone has their own experience with things so mm -hmm. but um, Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely taking into account what you said with these other, I guess, the skill in asking. Yes, yes. Something that I will definitely take into account. Um, and I think that I also, I think that I always look, think that or see asking for help as like a burden on someone that, I'm already apologizing when I'm asking mm. for help and and I'm also leaving it very open so that they can kind of tell me what's good for them mm -hmm. that sometimes maybe I need to I don't know and see it I, I don't know may um maybe put a bit more of um oh what am i trying to say not leave it so open so that yes. yeah yes and also to open up to the possibility that asking for help is not a negative thing is not a burden mm -hmm. necessarily but rather to contribute as much as you can for it to be a positive experience for both you and the one that you're asking help from because you know, as we said before, it could be a chance for them to finally support you, something that they might be longing for or just deepen the relationship. It's not a burden, sorry to burden you, mm -hmm. right? There are conditions that make it a burden. For example, if I'm left to my own fantasies of how I'm, uh, how much time, how much resources it needs for me, right? Yeah. If I kind of exposed to these negative fantasies, I might already just when you mentioned that, do you have time? I have an issue that I would like to discuss with you. I'm left to those fantasies. And then maybe mm -hmm. I had negative fantasies in the past with other people. And the mistake would be not to give them a clear framework. Right. And this is something that you can provide 
to turn this experience into something potentially positive, or at least to give them the chance to say no. Yeah. Right, and then they might say, I have too much on my mind, I don't have the capacity, or I'm not an expert, or whatever they say. Uh, but it will not be a kind of an, a complete rejection, and it will not feel like a complete rejection, because you gave them the parameters, so to speak, of the help situation. Okay, I'm interested uh, coming to the end. How do you feel right now? I feel better. I feel like in maybe like midway of, of talking today, <laughs> I was feeling a bit like um, that I was starting to feel like I wasn't connected in the conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just because of the topics we were talking about and um, that it was like I was having trouble really understanding what you were saying to me and also making understanding also like how I wanted to express myself or explain mm -hmm. but I think that now we've changed the, we kind of changed the topic a bit at the end in yeah. some sense that I feel more connected and I think that mm, maybe that this was that it was easier for me to like understand how I could manage this mm -hmm. new task I guess at the and I guess with the other I was still kind of confused as to how I could or I don't know maybe I was also just protecting myself and I was just like starting to get disconnected in the conversation but mm -hmm. um yeah I mean I think that there's things to like think about and <laughs> definitely and yes. try to somewhat come to some understanding of what's really going on and I don't know, slowly mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. what I would love to have for our next conversation is one mm -hmm. situation one situation that comes occurs again and again in those loops beyond that okay. if you want to investigate on your own what the pain point is and so on you can do that but I would like to have just one description of, you know, two months ago I was in this meeting and then that happened, something like that. Okay. Something that just, sure. you know, comes up as the loop situation. Beyond that, I'm still curious, but that's uh, everything is up to you. But um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about the topic of self love that we had yeah. last time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe that you reflect on it or that you do indeed a certain meditation where you, you know, plant those seeds of self-love and see what happens. I'm just curious, you know, to get a yeah. full understanding of you of the place of self-care and self-love, if there is something that is, um, needs more attention. And then yeah, of course, sure. as a consequence of uh, our conversation today, this topic of, um, self-sufficiency self-dependence and how that relates to me maybe being blocked to reach other people and to deepen friendships uh what the dynamic there is uh or if those thoughts lead to another insight of what constitutes such a block that right. makes it difficult for me to um to get the quality in the friendships that I have that I'm yearning for. So that might be connected okay. to self-sufficiency and self-dependence, or it might be connected to other themes, but I would be curious to um, continue to talk about that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.